thick on my heart um, when I think of this song and, and what it means um, to me. Uh, God is a restorer and, um, and we're broken. Um, and that brokenness could look different for each of us. Um, it, we still could be sitting in whatever sin. And this song could be sung over your life as an invitation. Um, it can be just to testify and to glorify God that yes, you are you are restored and you bring restoration. It can be this question you're saying, Lord, would you please bring restoration? So as we're singing this song, as it's meshing with your heart and your head, um, I just invite you to, uh, to find something that you're singing this over. Um, it, it is a truth and uh, if you want to just follow along with the scripture that, that's up here underneath it, that's fine too. But um, yeah, so Lord brings restoration. You bring restoration.
by a new name But you're taking my shame And in its place You give me joy you're taking my pain but you're taking by a new name you should take my shame and in its place you give me joy you take my morning and turn it into dancing you take my weeping and turn by a new
bring restoration to my soul. So it's so crazy we faith, we get to go from uh, Palm Sunday and Jesus coming in and us celebrating and, and singing, thank you, Lord, and save me, Lord. And um, depending on what we do the rest of the week, we get to spend time um, mourning Jesus' death. And then on Easter, we get to celebrate that he brings restoration and makes all things new. Um, we are moving now uh, into, um, back into Matthew, and uh, this so uh, Jesus comes down off the mountain, and everyone's gathering around him, um, and a leper, which let's just say that's us, um, maybe not because we have wounds on our skin, but because we're in need of a healer, um, the Lord meets us, and he touches us. Touches the leper and the leper is healed. So, uh, yeah, that's the Lord we had even before he was resurrected. It's pretty awesome. This song is called Run to the Father. Yeah. 
just invite you this morning to think about where is that? I mean, if you think about that song, Run to the Father, comes from the prodigal son story. And the idea there is uh, the son comes to the realization saying, I just want to get back to, to my dad. I failed, and I just want to get back to my dad. And I would just invite you right now as we come to the confession, uh, just think about maybe this week even. Where is that area in your life where you feel like you've just, uh, you missed it? We're going to take 30 seconds and just kind of have a time. You just be with the Lord on your own silent confession and invite you just to kind of take whatever that is and just put it up there with Jesus. So let's just go to the Lord right now. So Father, we come and ask that you would hear our prayer as we come and confess our frailty and our humanness this week in this moment, we just ask you would hear our prayer. ago I was sitting at the kitchen table Emma and the kids were gone and we were moving back to Charlotte actually and um, the Lord gave me this verse that I want to read to you and it, it just speaks to the song restoration and to the song that we just had and this is from uh, Psalm 73 I'm sorry this is from Isaiah 58 verse 12 this is in the message version I want you to listen to what he says here you'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. I think about that song, Restoration. I think about Run to the Father, and I think about the idea of confession. And here's the beautiful thing about our God. He is a rebuilder. He is a restorer. He mm -hmm. takes broken things and makes them beautiful. And just I want you to rest in that today. Whatever you brought to him in confession, uh, he's a restorer and a rebuilder and a renovator. That's what he does. Amen. Uh, we're going to take an offering now. I invite you just to, uh, to participate in the song if you want to or just listen. Uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. And
So I wanted to tell you all today about the worst sermon I've ever heard. Not, not the worst sermon I've ever given. That, that you all have heard before. But, but this is a story about the worst sermon I ever heard. And actually, as we were singing Restoration, I realized and looked up, it happened 15 years ago to this week. I was in seminary. I was a uh, senior up at Princeton Seminary. And I was sitting there, went into chapel, and this respected Old Testament professor stood up in the pulpit and began to preach through the genealogy of Matthew's gospel. And he was going through all of these Hebrew names, but he was doing it with great humor, so much so that everybody was kind of laughing at his sermon. As he was going through all the list of the names, he was telling these jokes and kind of these side comments And people were filled with laughter about it, so much so that by the end of the sermon, people stood up and started clapping and applauding his message. But you see, for me, it was the worst sermon I'd ever heard because it it lacked any hope of the gospel. You see, for me, that day, I was desperate and I was hurting. And it lacked any proclamation of the restoration and the hope of Jesus Christ. You see, that morning, that Monday morning at 8 a.m., I'd gotten a phone call from my dermatologist saying I need to be there at 4 o'clock to go over a biopsy result. And since I knew, I knew that my initial appointment had taken three months to get, I I was smart enough to realize that an eight-hour window meant that the news wasn't going to be good. But they kind of left me hanging there in the lurch. And so from 8 a.m. to 4, I was driving around just scared and weeping and wondering what God was doing. Ellie, my 15-year-old daughter, she was six weeks old at this point. I was graduating seminary, and now I was being confronted with a biopsy result of this. And so I snuck into chapel at noon, and I snuck in on the back row of the chapel wearing sunglasses so people couldn't see my tears and my eyes being red, as if the sunglasses would make me less conspicuous that way. But I was sitting on that back row 
hurting and desperate for a moment of hope, for, for some good news. But, but he was really entertaining, but, but he failed to, to share with us the hope of Jesus Christ. And so when everybody stood up and started applauding, I actually snuck out the back row and went over into the garden beside the chapel. And it was there that I began flipping through my Bible, and I came across today's passage. And so today I want to share with you all this story, this story in Matthew's gospel. And I want to share it because I'll bet you there's somebody in here who wishes they had sunglasses on, who's hurting and who's desperate right now who's in need of hope. So this message might not be for you today, but it might be for the person sitting next to you. So if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open them up to Matthew, the eighth chapter. If you've got your phones, you're more than welcome to flash them up on the screen right here and grab the passage we're going to look at. But we've been going through this series of Matthew's gospel, and we just wrapped up a whole long section on the Sermon on the Mount. And this is now when Jesus is coming down off the mountain And this is the very first encounter he has. And so as we turn to Matthew chapter 8, the first, second, excuse me, the second verse, let me turn to God in prayer for us. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to hear, open our eyes to see you, God. God, that some of us are in need of just a message of hope. That whatever's going on in our lives, whatever pain, whatever hurt, whatever sin, whatever brokenness we're, we're facing and struggling with this day, Lord Jesus, we come here seeking a message that you make all things right. And so, Lord, I, I pray over all of us, God, that you would awaken my heart, that you would awaken all of our hearts so that we might feel you in this space. Lord, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. So we're looking at Matthew, the eighth chapter, starting with the second verse. This is the word of the Lord. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt down before him. So again, Jesus has been teaching up on the mountain. Great crowds are following him. And as he's coming down and there's this great momentum towards him, all of a sudden the first encounter he has is with this man with leprosy, a skin disease. You see, I was diagnosed with melanoma 15 years ago, and I felt shame in that. But, but here's a man with a skin disease, a bacterial skin disease that, that causes shame and isolation in his life. So understand that a leper would have been separated from the community. So much so that people talk about sometimes they would require lepers to wear bells as they came through the public square so that people could run away from them and back away from them. So here is a man with leprosy, with this skin disease, And notice that he came to Jesus and he knelt before him. That word there, knelt, is a word we use to describe worship. It's the first person in Matthew's gospel to publicly worship Jesus Christ. Is this isolated leper. Somebody you and I wouldn't associate with. We'd be scared that we'd get contaminated being around him. And he comes and he kneels before Jesus Christ. And listen to his plea. He says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. Now, now think about that. This leper can't be touched by anybody because everybody is scared of getting contaminated by being around him. He hasn't been touched in years. Nobody would dare get close to him. And what's the first act Jesus does? He reaches out and touches him, gives him a hug, lets him know it's going to be okay. He he reaches out and touches him. And then he says beautifully, I will be clean. It's this beautiful combination of God's will and our deepest longings. It says, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. He's saying, kind of like, if you try to talk about this, you're going you're to mess up the, the story. Don't say anything to anyone, but go show yourself. Demonstrate this 
to the priest and offer the gift that is Moses commanded them for a proof, for a testimony to them. Go and show your whole life. Show them the restoration that's happened. Now, what Jesus is doing there is he's allowing this leper to go and be restored into the community. Leviticus 14, 1 through 32, goes into this elaborate detail of how a a leper, somebody with a skin disease, is to be cleansed. And I'm sure if you've ever tried to read through the Bible and you've gotten to Leviticus, usually about Leviticus 14 is where you fall asleep trying to understand what's going on here. But in Scripture, it goes through this really elaborate detail of how a leper is to be restored by going to the priest and offering this gift of Moses. And what Jesus is doing here is he's giving the man the opportunity to have a full restoration. He's not only physically healed, but he's also relationally healed, brought back into the community, emotionally healed in this, and spiritually healed as well. And Leviticus 14, it was to take eight days for the leper to be welcomed back into the community. But Jesus, Jesus does it immediately, offers this full restoration to this leper. The first public act of healing of an individual in Matthew's gospel is this story of somebody with a skin disease getting restored into the community, being brought into the fold. Now, when I look around the room, I'm going to make a little assumption here that you guys, none of us are struggling with leprosy, the skin disease, but I think some of us are struggling with what I want to call leprosy of the heart. You see, leprosy, the skin disease, was a bacterial infection that caused a neurological disorder. And so I looked up on PubMed, a definition of leprosy, and it talks about how leprosy destroys the nerve endings that carry pain signals. So you see, the problem with leprosy was that patients with advanced leprosy experience a total loss of physical pain. When these people can't sense or touch pain, they tend to injure themselves or be unaware of their injury. So you might not be struggling with leprosy, the skin disease, but, but do you have leprosy of the heart? That you've lost those pain receptors. That you've become numb to the pain and the lies and the hurt in your life. And, and that it becomes so dangerous that you could injure yourself or injure without even being aware of it. You've become numb to the sensation All the pain you carry, the brokenness of marriage, of a relationship, the pain of a disappointed life, of things not adding up to how you wanted them, the pain of having a biopsy report and wondering, and you just become numb to it. You see, our our culture, our culture goes around trying to give us comfort. And if you think about it, to numb us to the pain that we seek things to try to numb the pain in our lives, whether it's an opioid addiction, whether it's alcohol we use to just, what I call, drink ourselves to distraction, whether it's junk TV, junk food, social media, we use all of this stuff to numb our senses, to numb us. And our culture has taught us that pain is to be feared. But the truth of the matter is it's not pain that should be feared, but this numbness that we go through, this numbness of our hearts that we've allowed to happen, that we've allowed this apathy. I like to call apathy the disease no one cares about. That we live these apathetic lives, that we've just become numb to everything around us, And so we allow apathy to just infiltrate our marriages, our jobs, our work, our our lives. We've become numb, numb to everything. And I love there's this research they did back in 1981. The British Medical Journal published this research, and they took three categories of swimmers. They took kind of recreational swimmers and collegiate swimmers and Olympic swimmers. 
and they hooked him up to this machine. I think they were squeezing a, a ball or, or something, and it was caused pain. As each time they squeezed it, it would cause the thing to grip tighter and tighter and tighter. And so they are looking for when people felt pain. And, and the research to me is fascinating because what they discovered is all three levels of those folks, they all dis- felt pain at the exact same moment. And so the first part of the research showed that we all have the same level of pain threshold. We all say, ow, that hurts at the same kind of time. But then the researchers went on to see when would the folks give up. And what they discovered was the recreational swimmers would kind of stop after about 70 tries. And then the collegiate swimmers, they would go like 30% further. But the Olympic swimmers would go twice as long. And so the result of the research is that we all feel have the same pain threshold, but we can develop this pain tolerance that pushes us beyond where it kind of makes sense. If you think about the Olympians, I mean, think about Simone Biles and recently what she was going through where she realized she had pushed her body and mind so far that as she was flipping and spinning, she was talking about the, getting those spinnings and just losing all orientation of herself. And it terrified her. That we can push ourselves so far that we kind of lose all sensation. You know, I, lo- I love to follow kind of ultra runners and things. And there's this famous ultra runner named Dean Carnazzi. And, and one of his stories is that he has such a high pain tolerance that he was able to have a root canal without any Novocaine. I was hoping Tripp was here to fact check if, uh, how awful that would sound on me on this. But we can push ourselves when we become totally numb to the pain and the lives of our lives. And so what are the pain and the lies that you've been telling yourself, that you've become apathetic to? that I'm not wanted. Maybe you don't feel good enough. Maybe you don't feel like your parents care about you, that you'll never amount to anything. There, there's these lies and pains we've allowed to just infiltrate our heart and that we hold on to. That nobody understands you. Well, if they did, they would realize you're a big screw-up. That no one even sees you. You're hiding in the back with sunglasses, weeping. And nobody really cares. Or this attitude, if I don't do it, nobody will. I've just got to always be fighting, fighting, fighting. What's the pain and the lies you've been telling yourself that infiltrated your heart and you've just become numb to them? For the leper, he had a skin disease. For you and for me, we've got a disease of our heart. Leprosy of our heart. But remember the beauty of that story. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, before Jesus Christ, and cried out, Lord, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, I love how Mark tells this story tells it just like Matthew does. He introduces it. It's the first healing in Mark's gospel. But he adds on a little line that Matthew didn't have. He says, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man and said, I am willing. Mark adds in that beautiful little word, compassion. You see, at the root of the word apathy is this Greek and Latin word pathos, which means suffering. When we talk about passion, we think of like overexcited, like, oh, I'm passionate about the Panthers. Well, that's not true anymore. I'm passionate about whatever it is. We're like, I'm really fired up and excited about this. But the root word pathos means suffering. See, passion at its core means these are the things I'm willing to suffer for. And the problem with apathy is we're no longer willing to suffer for these things. We've become numb to them. But but Jesus shows up and it says he's filled with compassion. 
Two weeks ago, we came through the Passion Week uh, of Christ. We, we declared that Jesus was crucified for our sins. Passion, that he was willing to suffer for you. That he was willing to suffer for you. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched that man. In that moment, the untouchable, with the contact disease, Jesus reaches out and touches him. He takes upon himself the sin of that man. What had made him untouchable is transferred onto Jesus Christ. And he says, I am willing. It's a symbol of what Jesus is about to do later on in his ministry on the cross. That on the cross, Jesus is willing to suffer for you and for me and to take upon himself our sin. What we think makes us untouchable, unlovable, unapproachable. Jesus says, give to me. I am willing. And he takes that upon himself and he goes to the cross and he dies for you and for me. So that all of the shame and the guilt we carry over our past is gone. It's gone. Such that all the hope we have for the future is filled in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we get to live in this moment feeling the peace and the joy that Jesus Christ has paid it all for us and restores us, restores us spiritually, emotionally, physically, and relationally that we can celebrate that great joy. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so a moment, we're going to transition to communion. Communion is this opportunity where we come forward and we tear off a piece of the bread that we say is, reminds us of the body of Christ. And then we're going to dip it into the cup and say this cup is a sign of, of the forgiveness of our sins. That this meal gives us a, a little taste, just a little taste that maybe, maybe will reawaken us. Reawaken us to the hunger we have in Jesus Christ. Now, truthfully, I, I've watched y'all. Y'all tear off the daintiest little pieces of bread as y'all come forward. And, and so here's the deal. We're proclaiming this is the body of Christ for you. So don't tear off a little dainty piece of bread. In fact, I bought a second loaf of bread just in case. <laughs> but come forward and, and tear off the bread, remembering that Christ was willing to suffer for you. And dip it into the cup, knowing that Jesus Christ has washed away those sins for you. So, friends, this is the Lord's table. This isn't Waypoint's table. This is the Lord's table. He's the host of this table. And he invites those who believe in him, who trust in him, who've surrendered their lives to him, to come and to taste and to see how good he is. To just get a little, little taste of what eternity promises us. That little bread, the sweetness of the juice, is the sweetness God wants to give you. Now, here's the deal. At Waypoint, we don't go through the motions. And so if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I would invite you, don't feel compelled that you've got to come forward, but to just stay where you are and consider in your own heart right now, maybe what are the pain and the lies that you're struggling through? And what would it look like to surrender those to Jesus Christ and to cry out to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. But for those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, he invites us to his table. He says we'll come from north and south and east and west and sit together around this table. And so let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, you are good. Lord, we come running to you because we know we need you. Lord, I, I pray for the folks in this room right now who are hiding behind sunglasses, that are hurting and desperate in this moment and realize there's deep pain in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would meet them, that you would touch them and put your arms around them.
and that they would come and taste and see how good you are. For, Father, you are so good that you hung the stars in the heaven and you knitted me and us together in our mother's womb. You loved us more than we dare to imagine. Yet we turned our backs on you. We decided we knew better and we would do it our own way. And so we've tried so long to stuff down the hurt and the pain and to numb ourselves to this longing we have deep inside of ourselves. And so, Lord, we rejected you. But, oh, Jesus, you didn't reject us. You decided we were worth it. And so you came and you found us where we were and said, come, come taste and see and know how much you are loved. And so, Lord, I pray that you would transform this bread, this cup, these ordinary things into just an extraordinary reminder of how much you love us. And so would you hear us as we join with the disciples praying together the prayer you taught us to say, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So friends, on that night that Jesus was betrayed, that Thursday night before he went to the cross, he gathered together all of his friends And he sat him down at table. And as the meal was going on, he took a piece of bread. And he blessed it. And he broke it. Saying, this is my body that's been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup, this cup is a sign of a new covenant, a new promise shed by my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, You're proclaiming the saving death of Jesus Christ. So friends, friends, this is the meal that Jesus has prepared for you so that you may know you are loved and seen and cared for. Thanks be to God. Come, the table's ready. I hope you are. cup of salvation. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
you guys could stand with us. today that may the love of Jesus Christ be so in your hearts. So I would challenge you, if it's not yet there, please just come up. I'll be happy to pray with you. We'll be happy to just pray over you. So the question is, where is there numbness in your soul? Where do you feel numb? And what might you do to just begin to feel again? And so may God the Father watch over you. God who protects you, may he shelter you. And may Jesus Christ show you how much he loves you and to lead you back to that Father. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with all love, joy, and peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hey, you guys, if y'all are sticking around for the partner lunch, we'd love to, for y'all to join us in the rotunda. And if you want to, there's a great lunch and time together. Have a great Sunday.